Let's welcome Greg Sikanik, Chief of the National Wildlife Refuge System. Good morning, Dan. You know, for a moment I thought I'd just let the mayor continue on. Not much need for me to step up here. Those were great words. May we always be able to look to the sky, as the mayor said. All right. Well, good morning. Wow, the lights are down kind of low. I'm not seeing many of you. After that reception last night, I thought I'd get a pretty good glare off the foreheads this morning. You know, it was warm. It was fun. It was that beautiful Wisconsin blue sky. What a glorious day. What a glorious evening. Thank you for joining us. And I look around again, I am seeing a few of you now. It's like, I'm starting to get into that moment of like, wow, what an esteemed group. Conservation guardians from all around the country. This is just really, really exciting, this is cool. I'm humbled actually, and I'm honored to be among you. And actually, I, I need to say thanks. You all took time away from your busy schedules, you know, to travel great distances, to join us here as we really begin to think about, right here in Madison, Wisconsin, what it's going to mean for a vision for the National Wildlife Refuge System. So my role right now today is I'm going to open this up a little bit. You know, hopefully I'm going to provide you with a few thought-provoking sort of remarks, maybe get the old brain cells, you know, moving a little bit. It was a pretty good party last night, I'm sure. Maybe talk a little bit about our history, speak a bit to the work that we've already put into the vision effort, and hopefully maybe we'll set just a little bit of the course of what's going to happen through the course of the next few days. But first, let me thank the Fish and Wildlife Service Honor Guard for a remarkable presentation of the colors. This cadre of law enforcement officers are brand new to us. They only formed a year ago and they have become the pride of the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Interior. And for that, I say thank you. <laughs> Gina Swoop. Wow, huh? What an inspirational rendition of our national anthem. <laughs> and Secretary Stepp, thank you for your message. Thank you for welcoming us to Wisconsin. And as I already said, Mayor Paul Soglin, wow, that was, those were great words. How could you get any better of a welcome? And Mr. Melius, way to pump up that region, the Midwest region. Well done. So thank you all very much. We chose to come to Madison in part because of its historical significance to conservation. Here at the University of Wisconsin, you all know Aldo Leopold began our profession of wildlife management. Here is where he wrote the essays that would become a Sand County Almanac. This is the place where the land ethic was born. I hope each of you remember as I do the first time you picked up a copy of a Sand County Almanac and actually read it. I hope it did for you what it really did for me. It explains some of that connection to the landscape that you've felt about but you really didn't sort of put in your own words. You weren't there. And I'm sure, if you can recall, you probably pondered as I did the significance of that sort of ecology, the ecological connection that you actually felt as the fierce green fire died from the eyes of that old wolf in thinking like a mountain. So, Madison is a fitting place for all of us to come together. The stewards of land, water, and wildlife what a place to gather, and what a gathering this will prove to be. The energy I felt last night at the reception was nothing short of remarkable. It was exciting, it's powerful. Anytime you get a thousand people gathered with a conservation sort of perspective and background and interest, I know there were more deals cut last night to do things on the landscape than any other time, and I know they're going to continue because the important part of the business here happens when you're out having coffee and we're trying to actually get you to go to sessions and to do all those sorts of things. So keep that up. And it's remarkable for me to see so many conservation partners and friends sharing in this excitement. We have representation. We have all of the refuge management, 
We have refuges, wetland district managers, monuments from all over the country, friends from all over the country. And I'm grateful to see leadership from our state fish and wildlife agencies here with us. And I'm pleased to be honoring our recently confirmed director, Dan Ash, to this conservation gathering. Welcome, Dan. And yes, I would be remiss if I, if I did not take a moment to remember Sam Hamilton. And I am sure Sam's conservation spirit is with us this week. So the synergy of passion for wild places and creatures creates a powerful atmosphere to finish the work of crafting a vision for America's National Wildlife Refuge System. It actually sets the stage for us to plan and begin its implementation implementation to turn our words into actions. I must admit, you know, a lot of pondering has gone into sort of this whole event leading up to this. I wandered back a couple times to our gathering at Keystone, Colorado in the fall of 1998. You know, we first felt that powerful experience and emotion of gathering the whole large group together to consider a shared future. The vision we crafted there, fulfilling the promise, has actually served us incredibly well. And it is a foundation to our renewed vision, conserving the future. And I remember these words very vividly. We worked on these words. We toiled over these words. We are land stewards, guided by Aldo Leopold's teaching that land is a community of life, and that we love and respect, for land is an extension of ethic. We seek to reflect that land ethic in our stewardship and instill it in others. Those words are the first of the guiding principles of the National Wildlife Refuge System that we articulated in fulfilling the promise. These principles, they represent our core values, the things that never change, even when everything else around us does. It seems like everything is changing, and changing faster than we, as land managers and conservationists, have ever seen. Yet, things have changed before. They've changed in the past. Dramatic change. Challenge has occurred over time. Our conservation heroes and our colleagues rose to those challenges, just as we must and will rise to the challenges of today. Just as we must. Think for a moment. Put yourself back in time. What it must have been like to find yourself a conservationist in the second half of the 19th century. What was happening? Would you have known you were witnessing the extinction of the passenger pigeon? Would you have sensed that bison were being slaughtered until they nearly disappeared from the Great Plains? All in the brief span of a single generation. Think again what it must have been to witness the Dust Bowl coming on the heels of the Great Depression. Topsoil from the plains settled on ocean-going vessels in the fishing fleet of the North Atlantic. More than 100 national wildlife refuges followed on the heels of those dirty 30s. And more recently, think of the industrial impacts of the 1950s and the 1960s. An American river catching fire and discovering that the rain from the sky was falling to the ground as caustic acid. I actually remember. And our country responded. We demanded clean air and clean water. All right, keep thinking. Let's go a little closer to today. Not even a generation removed. Our colleagues, many of our supervisors, our mentors and our friends, witnessed waterfall populations plummet to all-time lows. They responded, and they delivered what is arguably one of the greatest conservation successes in recent time, the North American Waterfall Management Plan. With that effort, these mentors of hope, kind of the, they handed to the denizens of the prairies, to the flyways, a blueprint that showed the way for conservation delivery that restored continental waterfall populations. 
Yet, the North American plan is a simple construct. But the lessons are important. A shared vision, conservation targets, cooperation in the form of joint ventures, and finally, a means to deliver through the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the Migratory Bird Conservation Commission, and a new Partners for Wildlife program. So in each of these times, people rose to the challenge. They rose to the change of the time. And in these challenges, too, it must have seemed incredibly overwhelming. But they worked hard. They innovated. They persevered. And they had a vision. They had a vision. And they rallied. They rallied others to the cause. And you think back again, the names, Roosevelt, Miriam, Pinchot, Muir, Craigo, Leopold, Miri, Darling, Gabrielson, Salier, Carson, and the unsung so far, Harvey Nelson, are a few of these conservation heroes. And they gave us that gift of inspiration. They also gave us a cornerstone, the most important piece to a conservation foundation. And it's strong, and we will build our vision on that foundation. So I've been asked more than once by many, why now? Why start this vision process? And the answer, I think, is in sort of where I've been taking this, the challenges. The challenges are different today. Yeah, are they different today? I think the pace of change is unprecedented. The pace of change, I think, is what's different. We recognize ecological issues are of a planetary scale now. They are not local. The need to act is becoming urgent. The time to act is short, and the time to act is now. The Earth's climate, well, let's talk about that for a little bit. It's changing at an accelerating rate, and it has the potential to cause abrupt changes and to disrupt ecosystems and do what? Increase the risk of species extinctions what we care about. When I look at current flooding at places where I've actually worked, like Jay Clark Salyer, North Dakota, it, it's, it's, it's not only hard for me to believe, it's actually hard for me to, to envision or imagine that this little serene river called the Mouse River running through this little place in North Dakota is becoming a raging torrent. I mean, if I had to guess, I'm, it's likely to become the third largest lake in North Dakota for a while. The record-setting floods this year have affected nearly the entire Mississippi and Missouri River watersheds. At the same time, the Great Okefenokee Swamp is on fire for the second time in four years, with nearly 300,000 acres burned. Alligator River Refuge in North Carolina has been burning for months, again, also the second time in four years. Loxahatchee Refuge in South Florida experienced its most severe drought ever, closing a canoe trail because of a lack of water in Florida. Mississippi sandhill cranes are actually searching for the few ponds on the refuge that may actually still hold water. Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, those of you from there, you know so well, devastating wildfires. Throughout much of the West, huge areas of mountain pine forest have fallen victim to beetle infestations. Spruce bark beetles in Alaska have changed the landscape profoundly in many places. Katrina, Rita, Ivan, Ike, other fierce storms devastated so many of our coastal refuges. Those names are still fresh on our minds. We can now measure a rising sea. We are witness to coral bleaching events and hypoxia in the Gulf. Science may not precisely tie these individual weather events to climate change, but they are certainly consistent with the predictions, and we can expect more in the future. We know now that regardless of what is done to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the carbon that is already in the atmosphere will cause the climate to continue to warm over the next 50 years. The time is now. Bold conservation measures, the 
The time is now. We will help fish and wildlife adapt to a changing landscape. Climate change is not the only stressor. We can't get hung up and stop, and stop there. The US population is growing by 58 million in the last 20 years. It will grow by another 100 million or more by mid-century. It will grow by another 100 million by mid, I'm sorry, by mid-century. By 2050, by 2050, one in five will be seniors. One in five will actually be seniors. The demand for energy resources of all kinds is growing rapidly. What does that do? It's increasing prices, you've all felt it, and it increases the demands on the land. The demand on the land is huge. Over 400 million tons of grain the United States harvested in 2010. 126 million tons went to ethanol fuel distilleries, up from 16 million, 110 additional million tons in a 10-year span. This places a huge demand on our land and our already scarce water supplies. I spent five months on a detail to the Southern Nevada Water Authority in 2007. I witnessed and learned just how complicated water issues can be or how, they, how complicated they already are. If you live and work in the Southwest, the expected population growth is unbelievable. Your job will not get easier, nor will conservation be the highest priority when people simply need water for their own communities, for their own hometowns. All these pressures will further fragment landscapes. In turn, our role, we must work hard. We need to configure a landscape that will give wildlife a chance to adapt. As we consider our vision for conserving the future and the staggering array of these challenges we face, I think we are wise to reflect on Leopold's words. We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we all belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect, a community to which we belong, and with love and respect. So America is changing in other ways as well. Our nation is becoming more urban. 80% of our population are now living in and around cities. We are becoming more detached from the natural world. Fewer and fewer people are living rural lifestyles. They do not have a close relation and dependency on the land. It's out of sight, it's out of mind. We are getting older and we are living longer. The baby boom generation is becoming eligible for social security. The cost of social programs, it will squeeze priorities. You think it will squeeze a conservation priority? I guarantee it will. Yet, think about this aging generation. For one, it's to be celebrated, because I'm getting there. <laughs> but think about the opportunity, a potential gold mine of volunteers. If we welcome them to refuges, and yes, we will need to make sure refuges are age friendly and part of a live long and live well network. And I think we can do that. The children of the boomers are giving us a new baby boom. And talk about a wired generation. They are technically savvy, but they are less likely to engage in the traditions of hunting, fishing, and other outdoor recreations. I grew up in western Minnesota. I was fortunate to have a, a lake cabin near Tamarack National Wildlife Refuge. I spent many of my childhood days doing what kids do, swimming, running around, trapping turtles, sort of learning much about the wildlife of the area, learning to fish, learning to hunt. In a, at a 10-foot John boat in a small motor, there was a world to explore. I was enthralled with navigating the small boat. I was finding old logging channels that were cut earlier times, found backwater sloughs and lakes, and eventually I found a steady flow of the Otter Tail River, which led me to this very mysterious place, Tamarack Refuge. What a great place it was then, and actually still is today. I'm fortunate I get to get there every once in a while. I cherish those experiences. I wish every kid could do something similar. But I know, and to tell you the truth, I'm saddened. Most will not. 
Today, the information generation doesn't often get the opportunities that I had, and I hope that many of you had in your youth, but they know more about the world. They actually know more about ecology than I could have ever imagined in my youth. They traveled. They travel so widely, and yet they tend to overlook the resources in their own communities. So we must wire them in to conserving the future, because after all, the future belongs to them. So it's not news to anyone here in America that we are becoming more ethnically diverse. There are over 100 languages spoken in the Fairfax County School District where I live, Fairfax County, Virginia. 100 languages. We have a rich mixture of cultures in our nation, but the culture of conservation in, in many ways I fear is missing with many less likely to hunt, fish, and again, spend time outdoors, in recreational pursuits. The burgeoning population that is more urban and ethnically diverse presents us the challenge of building and maintaining a strong conservation constituency. Our constituents are important, more important than ever, as the economics and the national debt of our country makes competing for funding more difficult. As evidenced just last week by the 2012 House of Representatives mark, it's out there, we know, we have our challenge, we will step to the challenge. Today's economy is vastly different from the one we had at the time we were in Keystone. Our budgets were running surpluses, we were not at war. The opportunity for some of the big funding increases that we experienced, that we were fortunate for, the ones we saw in the past is unlikely in the short run. So if we want our conservation mission to remain relevant in a changing America, we must devise a means to grow a larger conservation constituency. It's imperative. All these changes present enormous challenge that threaten our wildlife conservation mission. The challenge for us is to find new and innovative solutions to this impending ecological morass. We need to step up. Let's move with a sense of urgency. We must tell our stories. We must tell our stories with the heart of a poet and the facts of a scientist as we engage Americans in the stewardship of our land. If we are going to succeed, we must have this shared vision of how we will go forward. That, in part, is why we're here. That is why we have worked so hard over the past two years to craft a vision for conserving the future. Our journey has been fascinating. Hundreds of people have worked to craft this vision. Thousands more have added comments to the bold ideas that enriched our discussion. We overreached. We took it too far, but we were open. We had a very open public process. We slid beneath the surface for just that little period of time. Then we kind of came up for a breath of air, and we produced a much more vision-oriented statement. I think you will find it. I hope you've had the chance to read it is really starting to come together. All your efforts, your hard work, your creative thinking have sort of sharpened our focus. This week we will work to refine and clarify that vision statement. So let me turn now for just a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the, the vision process and sort of where we are. I was struck by the extent of the comments concerning issues that frankly are huge. They're much larger than what we as a refuge system or what we as a Fish and Wildlife Service could probably deliver. There was an obvious to me, there was a hue and a cry for a comprehensive approach that addresses the conservation challenges of the 21st century. These very sentiments were expressed time and time again during the listening sessions for America's Great Outdoors as it was crisscrossing our country while it was out there on the road. America's Great Outdoors provides a comprehensive 21st century conservation agenda. Our recommendations, the recommendations in conserving the future vision, describe ways the refuge system will contribute to this overall national effort. So let me talk just quickly. I want to talk about four areas of conserving the future that I think are extremely important and I hope you find a little bit exciting. I'm hopeful they will whet your appetite for getting into the rich conversations, the discussions that will help us refine this even further over the next few days. First, the strategic growth of the National Wildlife Refuge System. It's something we're very proud of. 
An issue was covered in four recommendations in the vision document. The Refuge Improvement Act clearly tells us to plan and direct the continued growth of the National Wildlife Refuge System. We will contribute to the conservation of the ecosystems of the United States to complement the efforts of the states and other federal agencies. Have we capitalized on that one? We will conserve fish and wildlife in their habitats. So the first step that I think we need is to take a rapid top to bottom assessment of the refuge system's current acquisition projects. Those currently established refuges, those that have lands to fill in within the boundaries. Over the next year, we will be making decisions on a number of new refuges and major expansions that are already in the planning. Our decisions must be informed by a thorough knowledge of the importance of those current efforts. We still have much work to do in protecting habitats at places like Cache River, the lower Rio Grande Valley, and the grasslands of the Midwest. Our future plans must include finishing the most important work currently underway. We must not forget. Land protection strategies in the future must place refuges and protected areas in a landscape context and consider the role of working land. Efforts must focus on representation of ecological communities, redundancy of protection, adequate size and configuration, and the connectivity needed to effectuate these protected areas. Conservation will include the important role of working ranches, farms, and forests, as well as privately owned recreational properties in linking and buffering the key protected areas. We must recognize that collaborative efforts are essential in configuring a conservation landscape large enough to protect the natural world, the world that you love, the fish and wildlife we care so much about. We've been leaders in the development of these strategies in numerous places. The grasslands of the prairies, the Rocky Mountain Front, the Flint Hills of Kansas. Let's jump west to the foothills of California. How about to the southeast in the Everglades headwaters, to the northeast of Silvio Conti? But yet, there's much more to be done. We must finish a plan to guide the strategic growth of the refuge system. Here again, I think Leopold's advice does not just whisper to us here. It speaks loudly. To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. Every cog and wheel. Second, a strong commitment to conservation science. The refuge system is committed to a foundation of conservation science. It has application to refuge management decisions. It is supported through robust inventory and monitoring. On occasion, it will require deliberate research. And we must foster communication and collaboration with our state counterparts, academics, other service offices, and our partners. One principle is absolute. We must apply the best available science to your refuge management decisions. Whether managers, policymakers, we must ground our decisions and management actions with that science. It is not a luxury. It is not a luxury. It is a credit to our profession. It is remarkable to me that after 108 years, we still lack basic inventories of many of the life forms found on many refuges. We should know what we have so we can care for it properly. I'm pleased that we have reinvigorated our inventory and monitoring effort as a key building block for National Wildlife Refuges and Wetland Management Districts. I'm very excited by the progress we have made with our new Natural Resource Program Center in Fort Collins, Colorado. Thank you for participating. In conservation science and in so much of our vision, we will, of course, not succeed alone. I've said it many times. We intend to be both strong leaders and strong partners. Our work must be integrated with the plans of the states and coordinated with the efforts of landscape conservation cooperatives. If we coordinate research, we publish our results and share our findings in peer-reviewed journals, we will enhance conservation science and contribute broadly to designing more effective conservation delivery. We will have more effective conservation delivery. Third, a connected conservation constituency. Refuge System has a steadfast commitment to and a long-standing conservation partnership with America's hunters and anglers. 
This partnership has protected millions of acres. It has restored and enhanced land and waters throughout the nation and provided continuing opportunities for these traditions. Duck stamps. Duck stamps purchased by hunters continue to promote acquisition of important conservation land and water. I'm confident that refuges can provide new hunting and fishing programs, new opportunities, and we will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with hunters and anglers in support of conservation. We have a strong commitment to and from our volunteers and friends. We have added 10,000 new volunteers since Keystone, 10,000 new ones. We now have more than 40,000 volunteers helping us day in and day out on National Wildlife Refuges. We have 250 friends groups and our vision calls for all refuges and wetland management districts to become engaged. Community support and volunteerism are critical to successful conservation. But the truth is, we do not have a broad enough base of support to keep our conservation work relevant. The change in America and relevancy need to come together. We must grow our base of support by working in new places and in new ways. We must go where people live. What did I say earlier? That's the cities. Our vision calls for a new urban refuge initiative. We already have refuges in some pretty unique and pretty cool places. Philadelphia, Denver, Minneapolis, San Francisco, Portland, there's more. But we have not yet defined goals for success for urban refuges to reach new constituents. We have not made investments that speak to the potential of these urban treasures. Urban treasures. When we start looking at them that way, we will build some new constituencies. As we implement our vision, we will describe new standards of excellence for urban refuges. And not all of our work in cities can involve establishing a new national wildlife refuge, nor should it. Just like our Partners for Fish and Wildlife program has brought conservation beyond our boundary, our expertise is used outside of the boundaries. We need to look for that and take that to our urban areas. Let's take our expertise and let's use it. Aldo Leopold spoke to this dilemma many years ago. He wrote then, the problem then is how to bring about a striving for harmony with land among a people, many of whom have forgotten there is such thing as land. They have forgotten there is such a thing as land, among whom education and culture have become almost synonymous with landlessness. This is the problem of conservation education. That is the problem of conservation education. We can help change that. Fourth, let's talk about leadership for a little bit. The principles of leadership, like our core values, they're timeless. Leadership is and always has been a challenge to every one of us. It requires us to continuously learn and grow as professionals as we reach our fullest potential. For some of you, it will be striving to be the best biologist, to be the best tractor operator, to be the best fire specialist, law enforcement officer, equipment operators, the administrative professionals, to be the best that you can be, for others, it will lead to becoming that refuge manager, perhaps a regional director. How about a director? But ultimately, your decision about leadership, and yours alone, is what you can do for conservation. Each of us share a leadership challenge as we advance through the years and our careers. We must take the responsibility for preparing, mentoring, coaching, championing the next generation. Preparing a new generation of conservation leaders is a central reason we began this vision process, and it will remain a key tenet of our vision for the future. I'm always inspired by our professionalism, our leadership, our dedication, and passion of the people who work for and with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We're fortunate. We wake up each morning knowing that we may, may well make more money doing something else, but we can never earn an equal sense of accomplishment in any other work. You have chosen an avocation, not a vocation. Nothing makes us prouder to watch a young person with whom you've spent time flourish and grow. I have been especially proud to watch Rebecca Martin 
and Michael Gale flourish and grow as they have risen to the challenge of leading this vision process. Michael, Rebecca. And I have been equally gratified watching Cynthia Martinez coach and mentor them. This is leadership in action. Cynthia, well done. So as we begin our deliberations, I ask you to think of how. How will you help to implement this vision? Are the things that you are working on day in and day out really helping make this vision come to life? Are you asking yourself whether your work is relevant to the changes we face, to the challenges we face? What could be more important to your legacy, to your individual legacy, than ensuring a long-term conservation viability of the place that you have come to love? Are you working to project conservation benefits beyond the boundaries? Are you engaging our state wildlife counterparts? Is your work meeting those challenges we face? Are you the manager, supervisor, or the executive who is always too busy to mentor a young person? If you don't make development of future leaders, including yourself, a top priority, are you moving the conservation vision forward? Are you stepping to those challenges? So I ask every one of you, challenge yourself and help us realize a vision for conserving the future. This is our time. We will carry the work forward. I want you to be excited. I hope you are. Bring your enthusiasm. Conserving the future, wildlife refuges and the next generation, it's in our hands. So I want to close with the words of another famous conservationist from Wisconsin. Many of you probably know Sigrid Olson. He told us, respect the land. It has intrinsic value that our spirits need. Don't be afraid to fight for it. It is worth the struggle. Let's make this week everything it has the potential to be, and let's have some fun along the way. I am so honored to be amongst all of you. Thank you.